Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Kiddush and Daf Kavchet. Shabbat Tov to everyone. This week's learning is sponsored by Alana Storch. Thank you for Rabbanit Michelle for guiding and navigating us through these complicated Dapim and for creating this extraordinary and loving community of Hadran. Thank you for the warm, all for the warm welcome in real time in Israel and in person, uh, in real time and in person here in Israel. Today's learning is sponsored by the Hadron Zoom group in honor of their dear friend and co-learner, Julie Mendelssohn, and her daughter, Hannah's marriage to Daniel. We wish Hannah and Daniel much happiness in the spirit of what we learned together in Masechet Svetah, Ish Bisha Zahu Shechina Benehem. Mazal Tov. Okay, we're going to get started with, we kind of finished in the middle, with this idea of Gilgul Shvua. We're going to finish up the Mishnah. The previous Mishnah, we're going to have three Mishnah today. The previous Mishnah talked about at the end of it that we were talking about differences between movable property and non-movable property. And what we said is that when it comes to movable property, we can have you take an oath in all sorts of situations. But when it comes to land, we can't. So for example, mode de or if there's one witness, we'll get back to the one witness case. We can normally, you need two witnesses to prove something, but two witnesses in a monetary case about, about, pro, um, about movable property is enough to actually require an oath. Okay, you can take an oath and then you can get what you're claiming. If you're if you have one witness to support your claim, then you can take an oath and your claim will be validated by the oath. So in other words, the one witness's testimony will actually be validated by your oath, and then you're good. To, you can go with whatever that one witness had said. That all works in movable property. It doesn't work for land. However, if we have a disagreement about something where there's movable property and I'm already liable to take an oath or you're liable to take an oath, whichever side. And then there's an issue. We have a, an argument also about land. Then once you're taking the oath about the movable property that you're li that you're obligated to do, or you can't right then, or you have the option to do that. We also force you to take an oath about the land as well. Okay. So once you're already obligated, oath, we can make you take oaths about things that normally you wouldn't be taking oaths about. So where is all this learned from? It's learned, we started that, it was the first question of the Gemara. What's the source for this idea of Gilgul? Gilgul is to roll, it's to roll over, basically. We're rolling over your obligation of an oath in one case to a different case where you're normally not. So then we asked, what's the source? And the source is from the Sota, to which the Gemara ended and said, wait, if you're going to learn it from the Sota, and that's because she also takes the oath that, she didn't cheat on her husband when she was betrothed. Now, there was no suspicion at that point. There was no anything. She certainly doesn't need to take an oath about that. But once we're making her take an oath about the case where he did see her going there, there were witnesses that she went to a room alone with the man. Then we can also make her take an oath about a situation where she wasn't necessarily obligated. So now the Gemara said at the very end of yesterday's death, Ella Eshkachan Sota de Isura. Well, Sota is in a case of Isser where you know, maybe she's a married woman and there's all sorts of issues, what we call in the world of Isser Beheter, things that are forbidden, things that are permitted. That's a whole different world realm than Dine Mamanot. So monetary law, usually we can't necessarily compare one to the other. So Mamona Minala, where do we get that this Gilgul Shvua also by monetary cases? To which they bring a Braita from the school of Rabbi Ishmael, Tana Debe Rabbi Ishmael, Kavachomer, simple Kavachomer argument. Now, I just told you that one witness is not generally accepted in a court. But when it comes to a monetary issue, one witness can create a situation where we force you to take an oath about something. So we're going to say the following. If the sota, which, if there's only one witness, how does the sota work again? She's, he, the husband suspects the wife of talking with some man and warns her. And then if she goes into the room alone with that man and there's witnesses that saw her go into a room alone with that man, then he can bring her to be a convictor of being a sota. And then we have to go through the whole process. And then she's obligated to take an oath, this Gilgul Shvua. Well, that happens, right? You can't even make her do that oath unless there's two witnesses. First of all, right? There are certain things that we allow one witness for. For example, oaths, we allow one witness to say, my house is kosher, like But now when it comes to issues of, is she a married woman? Is she, you know, did she cheat on her husband? Is she now going to be forbidden to her husband? That you need two witnesses. And yet, so it's got this issue that you can't do it with one witness, but yet Megalgaline, 
But yet you do have this issue of Google Shvua. So mamon, shenitani tavav edacha, the money that you can demand back based on one witness testimony by taking an oath, ain't no din shmagalgalin. So can't you then obviously say that Google Shvua will work because it seems easier to create a situation where you would have to take an oath, right? The, the Sota takes an oath only if there's two witnesses. Uh, Dina Mama Oud, uh, an issue of monetary law, you would take an oath even with one witness. So therefore, all the more so, we should say if Gilgal works there, Gilgal should work here. Now the Gemara asks another question, which is, Now, this is a little bit of a strange question because we already learned it from the Sota, and the Sota we know is not a, a Vada situation. If we know for sure that what woman cheated, we don't go through the Sota ceremony. We basically say immediately the husband is forbidden to be with his wife, he must divorce her, and we move on. Okay, and plus there's death penalty for her and, and the person she committed adultery with. So this is a bit of a strange question, but their assumption seems to be like this. We can understand now, once we, we've gotten out of the realm of Sota, we've learned from Sota to monetary law. Now, that means that if we have this disagreement and I claim you owe me all this money and you claim, you know, uh, first I claim you owe me um, property, oh, um, not property, movable property. And you say, listen, I only really owe you half of what you're saying. And then I say, by the way, you also owe me land. And then once you're taking the oath on that, you can take the oath on the land. Now, it makes sense. And this is why I think they get into this badai, that that's in a case like a motive of mixad is when I say you owe me this money. I know called the Tanat Bari. There's Bari and there's Shema. Here they call them Vada and Safek. It means the same thing. If I come with a definitive claim, so I get that I can be Megal Shvua onto my definitive claim. But Safek, Minalam. But if I say, I think that that's my land, you know, it's much less likely we're going to obligate you in, a, in an oath. If, I, if I'm just claiming, I think you owe me land, right? I have a reason to believe, but I, I, I don't really know. So we get that there's Gilgal Shavu and Avada case. How do we know that even if I don't bring a definitive claim and say, I know, right? just because I'm definitive doesn't mean I'm right, but it's usually a much stronger claim if I say, I know, as opposed to I come and say, I think. So how do we know that if I just say a second claim that also we can make a Gilgal Shavu? So the answer, Tanya, we can learn it from this bright. Rashbi, which is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai Omer. There's a shvua that takes place outside and the shvua that takes place inside. What are we talking about? We're talking about inside the temple. Where's the oath inside the temple? The sota. And there's an oath outside the temple, which is the monetary oaths. So now they say the following. And the one we're talking about is the Gilgal shvua, this extra oath. Again, you're not taking an extra oath, but you're taking an oath on one thing and we make you add something else. So how do we know that we can add it even if it's a suffix claim on the part of the other side? Because when it comes to the shvua that you say inside, we treat a sefek like it's a vadai, meaning we make you take an oath. Well, this actually can mean a bunch of different things, but let's go with one interpretation. We make you, now she takes an oath on something that the husband's claim is not definitive, right? The husband doesn't know what happened in the room. He has no idea. Did they have relations? Did they not have relations? So even though we still make him take an oath, or you could claim maybe it is Vadai what he's making her take the regular oath about because she went into a room and there were two witnesses. Maybe that is a Vadai claim because for sure she went into the room. But remember, what's the Google Shvua? That even when she was betrothed, now he doesn't know that anything transpired between this couple when she was betrothed. So he certainly doesn't have a definitive claim about that. And yet it's as if it's a Vadai meaning we make her take an oath about it. So therefore, Af Shvua Bachutz Asaba Safek Vadai. So therefore, if if in the temple we're going to require this, then obviously outside the temple, we're going to be able to, right? The assumption is a, a, an oath inside the temple is going to be a higher level, meaning we're going to be less willing to have oaths, right? And if their safek is like a vadai, then certainly outside the temple, we can also do this Google shvua and safek to vadai. Okay, so what we did in this section was understand the Gilgal shvua we learned from Sota, how do we learn from Sota to monetary law? And then how do we know that it's even on Suffolk doubtful claims, right? A claim that the, the, the person claiming you owe me the money, who then makes the person take an oath, can make them take an oath even based on just a non-confident claim, you could say, or not definitive claim. Now we have one last thing about Google Shvua. Ad hechan Gilgul Shvua. This could be a little hard to follow. 
um, the Gemara is going to have trouble following it. We're going to have to understand, which really means to what extent can we do a Gilgul Shvua? Basically, give me the most extreme case of a Gilgul Shvua, where you wouldn't have thought that you have to do a Gilgul Shvua, that you could take an oath about this. And yet we do. Now, we already know land. Okay, That was already in the Mishnah. So that's certainly not going to be on the case of land, right? That already seemed like a pretty extreme case that land, you generally don't take an oath, and yet we make you take an oath in this case. So what's an extreme example of, it's going to have to be more extreme than land, basically. I'm a Rav Yehuda Mahath. So Rav is going to bring, or Rav Yehuda is going to quote Rav, is bringing an answer to the question. And then they're going to say, this doesn't make any sense that this would be an extreme case. This actually doesn't make sense that this would be a case at all because it's got some other problem. And therefore, Rav is going to have to try to understand what did Rav mean. So that's why I say it's complicated because complicated to the extent that we don't understand what Rav means because it seems to go against something else basic that we know. De Amrle, so Rav, first let's see what Rav said and then we'll see what the problem with it is and then we'll see how Rav explains it. If I come to you and I say, take an oath that you're not my slave. Okay, now, basically that means I'm claiming, now here we're talking about slave, Gentile slave, Canaanite slave. I come to you and I say, you're my Canaanite slave. Now you're Jewish, okay? And I'm claiming you're a Canaanite slave. So that's the case according to where this is an extreme case where you would have to take an oath saying, I swear I'm not a Canaanite slave. I'm Jewish. To which the Gemara says, this can't possibly be. Hahu, if I would make such a claim, I would get excommunicated. Now here, this is something very relevant nowadays. This is what we call slander. I'm basically slandering you because I'm saying you're a Canaanite slave instead of saying you're part of the Jewish people. Okay, and I'm not allowed to make a claim like that. Now, this is a good question. What if it's really true? Okay, so the commentaries try to discuss this and, you know, what if it's really true? And maybe there's a difference if I say it on the street or if I go to court and make a claim in a court. You know, this slander, right? Slander in a court where maybe I'm, I'm going in a legal way, maybe it would be different. I, I don't know if the law is actually, but, you know, if I, if I do it in the court and then I'm saying, listen, this and this happened. But here it seems like I'm making a basis claim on one of you who, let's say, is everybody knows you to be Jewish, and, and I just come one day out of the blue, and I say, by the way, you're my king, my slave. Okay, and that would be the case for sure, where we'd say, what are you talking about? And you're coming out of left field, and you have no, also, I have no basis for my claim. It's just my word. So that would be clearly slander, and I would actually get excommunicated. And furthermore, this Brighta says, and I'll give you some commentary that I read about what the difference between these three punishments are in the three cases. Um, you know, and I'll already start you on it, which is why am I excommunicated? Because I was trying to kind of excommunicate you, remove you from the community by calling you someone who, you know, can't be part of the regular Jewish community as a Canaanite slave. And, you know, so therefore I should be ostracized. We call it Midah Keneged Midah. We had all those sugyot and sota about that. Mamzer sofeka de harbaim. If I call you a mamzer, I get lashes. This connection that I saw in the commentary, not it, what is lashes, right? I'm physically, I get physically punished because I physically caused you pain. Why physically? Well, because I'm not calling you not a Jew, but you can't marry a Jewish woman, or a regular Jewish woman, right? Only a mamzer or something like that, a mamzeret. And therefore, I'm basically all, like causing you pain. And that's why we give me pain. That's a little bit weaker, that connection. Rasha, you're waiting all the chayab. If I call you an evil person, you can just ruin my life. Okay, you're waiting all the chayab. Okay, Rashi explains you can um, let's look at Rashi. You're waiting all the chayab. Rashi says, Klomal, Lizo, Ain, Beitin, Nizkakin, Aval. Okay, there would definitely be no oath or anything. Aval, Humu, Tarlis, Son, Oto. This is a very interesting. You're allowed to hate me if I call you an evil person. And even Lema'et, Bas, Pernasato, Ule, Relu, Manuto. You can even ruin my career, okay? Like, let's say I own a store. You can open a store right next door and start selling the same items and charge cheaper prices and get, you know, make me lose all my business, okay? Things that generally you're not allowed to do. In this case, and again, this goes back to laws of, right? If you slander somebody, then basically you are, um, you're responsible, right? You get punished. It's, Basically, this is another way of saying it. it's forbidden for you to just slander people and call them names, name calling, right? And all of that. Okay. So, um, right. Because here, if I call someone a Rasha, what will happen? People might stop buying from that person. People stop doing business with them. So therefore, you can ruin my business. 
Again, a midaki negami. Why was this all brought? Because it can't be that there's a Google Shavuot. If I go and have a baseless claim and claim you're my Evik Nani, we certainly don't make you take an oath. And we go even more than that. We punish me and not make you take an oath that you're not an Evik Nani. So Ella Amarava, Rava comes and explains what Rav says. As I told you, we're going to have a struggle with what Rav says. We're going to have to re-explain it. Ki shavali shalonim kartali be'evit ivri. Ah, it's that I said you're a Jewish slave. That's different. Okay. Now, what does it mean if I say you're a Jewish slave? It basically means that you owed me money because you stole from me, right? And now I'm claiming you stole from me and therefore were sold to be my Evid. So let's look at, and that's the extreme case of Gilgul Shvua. And in that case, again, if we had a claim on something else as well, that you were obligated Shvua, I can make you take an oath about this as well. To which they say, what are you talking about? Haitan tamal yatehi. Mamoni legabe. This is just a a classic case of mamon. So of course there's Gilgul Shvua. There's Gilgul Shvua in mamon, of course, if there's Gilgul Shvua in land, there's clearly Gilgul Shvua in, in a monetary claim, right? It might not be a case where you have to take an oath, but if you had to take an oath about something else, of course we can make you take an oath about this as well. So that doesn't make any sense either. To which the answer, no, it does. Why? Rava Latame. Rava is consistent with his opinion somewhere else. Da'ama Rava. Evid Ivri Gufo Kanor. Remember we saw this? He holds that the body of the Ebed is actually acquired by the owner as well. So it's not just mamonot. It's not just, oh, I'm really claiming you stole from me. But it's more than that because I'm claiming that I own you. You, I own your body right now, right? For payroll and for proceeds. I don't own you like an Ebed Kanani, but I do own your body to a certain extent. Now, so then they say, okay, now if we have a scale of movables, right? These are things we've been talking about all along. Movables, right? There's animals, slaves, right? And then land. Land is always on the extreme. So if land is on the extreme and we already know land is included, then of course slaves, if their goof was acquired by me, that would be at least no different than land, okay? So to which they say, it's really no different than land. And if we already know land from the mission, this is not a more extreme case than land. So now they have to explain why it's more extreme than land in this issue. Again, what's the claim? Let's talk about the claim in land and the claim in slaves. Claim in slaves is you're walking around as a free person, you know, living on your own. And I say you're actually my slave, right? And all your proceeds belong to me. If it's land, basically you're on land and I say it's my land, right? You're living in my land. So you have to swear I bought it from you, okay? Or something like that. So now, so they say, My claim is that this is my land, and you say, it's not my land, right? And then, I'm sorry, you say, right, you say, I bought it. Now, the question is, where do we, if you bought it, shouldn't we know about it, right? So the idea here is that, um, Sorry, it would be, I claim, one second, let me think for a minute. Right, you're, sorry, you're living in the land and I claim I bought the land. And you take the oath that it's really yours. Sorry, I said it the reverse. You, I claim I bought the land, but you're living in the property. And you, and you say, no, it's mine. Now, what's the issue? We don't know, was there a sale or not? Now, the question is, if I, if I really bought the land, will we know about it? Right? Not necessarily. This is what the Gemara says. There's no, it doesn't, word doesn't always get around. It says here. Okay, let's go back again. You might say, sometimes, not always. And and actually this contradicts different sugya, which we'll see in, in Baba Batra, that land is always, there's a call about it. Everybody knows when you sell land, okay? But this is claiming that sometimes anyway, People sell land secretly. Why? Why do people sell land in secret? Well, selling your land is usually an indicator that you don't have money, right? Nowadays, people buy, sell because they want to buy something better sometimes. Sometimes they sell land because they really need the money. So in those days, generally, that was why you sell property because you usually stay with your own land. We've been talking about this in the previous Dapin, right? People did it because they have no money. So you don't want people, you don't want to lower your credit rating and if you, let's say, everyone knows you sold land, the store might not sell you on credit anymore because they'll say, oh, well, you might not pay your money back. 
let's pay the money back. So I'm not willing to sell to you. So people sometimes sold in secret. Therefore, it's possible that a sale happened and we don't know about it, okay? And that's why we allow the oath because it's not necessarily a given that we're gonna know about it if it happened. Whereas, not the same with a slave. First of all, there's no issue, like I just said, of, oh, if you bought a slave, it doesn't mean your credit rating's low. The opposite means your money, right? So if someone, everyone generally knows when a Jew is sold to be a slave, and therefore, you might say, maybe there's no reason for an oath because I'm claiming you're my slave. You're claiming no. And all the evidence proves, right? There's no, if if we had known, if you had really been sold, we would all know about it. So maybe you don't need to take an oath to claim I wasn't sold as a slave because it's obvious you weren't sold as a slave. That's why the mission is telling you, no, you need to take an oath in this case, Okay. Because of Gilgal Shvua. The Gilgal Shvua even extends to this case. So if we go now on the scale, the scale goes from movables to land to slaves at the end. Because slaves, there's more of a call or there's less of a chance that it would happen without our knowledge than with the land. And yet we still have to give Gilgal Shvua, right? Which again, you would have thought your claim might be stronger because you have the, the fact, the lack of any rumor about you being a slave that should support your claim and you wouldn't need to take an oath. No, you actually need to take an oath. What happens, by the way, if you need to take an oath? If you don't take the oath, in this case, I claim you're my Evid Ivry and you won't take an oath, theoretically, I could claim you're my Evid Ivry. If you're not willing to take an oath about it, then you're mine. So that's the issue. Okay, moving on. New mission. We're going to have a very complicated mission here because it's not going to be clear what they're talking about. The structure of what we're going to do right now is we're going to read this Mishnah. There's two sentences and there seems to be something not like they don't seem to be connected, even though there's a connecting word. OK, which basically means they are connected and they're not going to seem connected. And the Gemara is going to reject the first way of reading it and say this doesn't make any sense. Um, mainly, well, one of the reasons is because of the connector and you'll see another reason why. Then they're going to explain the Mishnah in a different way. But then they're going to go back and say, what were they even thinking in the first place? How could they have even thought of reading the Mishnah? And we're going to have two options of how to read the Mishnah according to the rejected reading. Okay, so it's a little confusing because in the end, we're going to have the real reading, but then we're going to suggest two alternative readings as to what exactly the Mishnah was claiming, what the reading of the Gemara of the Mishnah in the first place was. How did they think the Mishnah was read when they asked the question that they asked? So without more introduction, let's read it. Now, this is what causes all the problems because it's not a very clear term. Something that is made money for something else, not really clear what that means. So they think it means money, like coins, right? Something that can be used to acquire something else, which is usually money, okay? So coins. If we do a chalipin, now chalipin could mean one of two things. And this is why also it gets a little confusing. Chalipin until now we've been discussing is what we call also in Hebrew a kinyan sudal. Sudar is like a handkerchief. Okay, it's where we pick up a handkerchief. Okay, one side or the other doesn't have a look at which side, the buyer or the seller. For now, we're just gonna, it doesn't really, we'll say it doesn't really matter. One side picks up a handkerchief. Let's say I'm buying something from you. I take a handkerchief from you and I lift it. Okay, or you take a handkerchief from me and lift it. Usually you give it back. Okay, it doesn't even stay with you. It could stay with you, but it doesn't necessarily. It's a symbolic act that shows we're doing a deal nowadays, right? We would call this a handshake or something, right? In some areas of, of business, handshake is everything um, in some cultures also. Anyway, let's just say it's like that. We've done a symbolic act to show it's a done deal and then it's done. Okay, that's one way of saying chalipin. Another way of chalipin comes to the word lachlif, which is to, to switch, which is a barter system. Right? Right? They didn't always use money in those days, right? They traded things. So they traded, right, your ox for my cap. So as soon as, when do you do the Kenya? When one side, right, the, right, this is the question, but when one side pulls one animal, right, I give you my ox, you pull the animal, already I've gotten your Okay, that's the exchange. That's an exchange. It's a barter. So this money chalip, there, I'm sorry, there's um, handkerchief chalipin, which is just symbolic. And then there's chalipin, which is barter. And when one side pulls one, which is mashicha, the classic Kenyan we've been talking about for movable items, then the other one, right, the, the Kenyan is acquired. 
The other thing is, what does it mean, the Kenyan? It's a Kenyan. So there's two nafkaminas, two relevant things. Rashi points out one, Tosa points out the other. Some people actually view it as a bit of a machloket about which one the Mishnah is talking about. When it says, when one acquired that, the other one was could mean, number one, he can't change his mind and say, listen, I don't really want to give you my animal. Right. If I pulled one animal, I can't say to you, listen, I don't really want to give you my animal anymore because I already have your animal. Or it could also mean who's responsible for damages. Right. If I pulled your animal and now my animal is actually yours, but it's in my possession. What if it drops dead? Right. Then I have to provide you with a new animal because we've already done the deal and it's as if it's yours. So this gets back to and we'll get to there later. Right. That issue where we said, well, money doesn't work because otherwise, you know, it'll there'll be a fire in my attic and I'll just say, oh, sorry, your wheat burned in my attic and I won't really try to make an effort to save your wheat because what do I care? It's not mine. I don't assume responsibility. Anyway, that's a lot of background. We haven't really explained anything yet. So let's read it the first way the Kabbalah is going to read it, which is, which is money, coins. As soon as, so if I'm buying something from you and I give you coins, now we're talking about chalipin as if, I don't, I either give you and you lift them, right? We seem to be talking not money that I paid for it, but I gave you money for chalipin and we lift up the money, let's say. Once one of them lifts up the money, so the other person who has the item, the seller is already, right, responsible. He has to give it to the other side. And again, if damages happen, it's on the other side's damages, right? In other words, they're responsible. So meaning money can be used for Kenyan Khalipi. Now, this is going to be a big problem. And what we're going to say, this can't possibly be what the Mishnah means for two reasons. Number one, there's a machloket. Can money be used for Khalipi? And when they have that machloket, they don't quote our Mishnah. So it doesn't make any sense that that would be what a Mishnah is saying. Secondly, the Mishnah is going to say, Ketzad, how does this work? And you're going to notice there's no money mentioned here. Okay, Ketzad. And now they're going to talk about the other kind of Khalipi, not the symbolic one, but the barter one. If we trade my ox for your cow, or my donkey for your ox, okay, it doesn't really matter which one. As soon as I give you my ox, then your cow is already considered mine, even though it's still in your domain. So now, what does that have to do with the first part of the mission, which was talking about a symbolic king and with money? And furthermore, we're going to see right now in the Gemara, chalipin maini. So first they say, what are we talking about chalipin here? Matbea? What? You're saying chalipin can be done with a matbea? Shma mina. Matbea nasa chalipin. It would then be clear from our Mishnah that a coin could be used for chalipin. And this is a subject of debate elsewhere by a Moraim. And it doesn't make sense. They would have this debate if it's an explicit Mishnah. So now, why would money not be able to be used for chalipin? And we're going to talk about today's, we're going to talk about what can be used for chalipin, right? Generally, we use a handkerchief. Handkerchief falls into the general category of vessels, okay? Clothing, um, other, you know, bowls, things like that are all in the category of vessels. Then we're going to talk about produce. Okay, produce is obviously less good than vessels because produce eventually spoils or rot, you know, gets rotten. And then the third option is, um, is what's called, is money. Okay, now money is the worst because money, What's the value of money? The value of money is is kind of um, what do we say? It's it's um, arbitrary, right? And theoretically, the government, right? The money is not the value of how much silver is in this coin. The money is whatever the government decided it's going to be. And sometimes the currency could just crash, be valued at nothing. So chalipin has to be done with something of value. Okay, so money doesn't have inherent value because it could be changed at any moment. We were just talking yesterday at the table, friends of ours had gone to um, to Vietnam and we were kind of laughing about the currency there and you know how it's like thousands of, of dong is like worth almost nothing and in our currency. And then I was re- re- reminded what, when we went to Cambodia and we took out money in the, in the ATM machine, it came out in dollars because their currency was so weak that they didn't even use their currency barely. And they often use dollars. So here you see that a currency could be almost really valued at almost nothing. It could, could really drop in value. So basically what they're saying is it doesn't make sense that we're talking about money here, that money was used for Khalipin. I see somebody wrote in the chat, what about pulling? Don't you have to pull? So again, Pulling is the general way you acquire metallic, but you can also acquire them with chalipin, okay? 
not money. Remember, ma'ot don't acquire, although maybe on a Torah level, and we'll get back to that, but not on a rabbinic level. Generally, you have to pull it, but you can also do a Kenyan with Chalipin. So now, what's this Mishnah saying, basically? I'm a Rav Yehuda, so here's the real explanation of the Mishnah. We're not talking about the symbolic Chalipin here. We're talking about the other Chalipin of a barter. Hachi Kamra, and this is what it means. Now, how do we get this from the words Kol damim ba'achir? What does it mean? Kol hanishom damim ba'achir. Anything that can be valued as money and therefore traded, okay? Meaning an item like an ox that has value that I can go to an assessor and say, okay, assess how much is this worth? And he says, $100. And we take your para and we assess its value, $100. And we say, oh, great. We can trade these because this is worth 100 and that's worth 100 So anything that has inherent value, that can be, its value can be assessed. So if we're going to do this barter, moving now to Amabet, we can do a barter with those kind of items. And now the second sentence fits perfectly with the first. Here we resolved it. What we had to do is we had to change a little wording because it doesn't really mean what it means. It has value that can be evaluated, a particular value. So if I give you mine, right, then as soon as I give you mine, yours is considered mine. Daikanami, the katani, you can also, and now they're going to say this is a perfect, right? We're going to prove this reading because of what it says in the second part of the Mishnah. Okay, that makes perfect sense. And that's really the way to read the Mishnah. But that's not satisfactory to the Gemara to the extent that it is satisfactory, but they can't even understand what were they thinking in the first place. They say, Sometimes the Gemara does this, they go, I don't even understand when the Gemara first thought it was money, how on earth did they think to read the Mishnah? And now, even though we rejected that possibility, what they want to know is, how would you have read the connection between sentence one and sentence two if you thought it meant money? And, and now we're going to give a possible explanation and say that only works if you hold this. So then we're going to have to give an alternative explanation if you don't hold this, which we'll see what that is. So, so the fact that you thought in the beginning, you thought that this mission was telling you that money could be used for a chalipin symbolic transaction, my kitzad, how's the kitzad work? So they say the way it works is like this. The first sentence, there were two sentences. Money can be chalipin, that's what we thought, can be used in a symbolic exchange. And then we had this second sentence, which said the, the shore and the chamor and the, and the para and the switching the animals. Well, there must have been a middle sentence in between which was this, right? Usually they call it a chisur mechasre. It's missing words and this is what it says. So first it said money can be used for chalipin. And hachi kamar, this is what it means to be saying after. Peho nami abde chalipin. Produce, remember I told you, there's this range. There's money, which is really doesn't have any inherent value and is the weakest possibility for can abuse for chalipin. Then there's peyrot, produce, which again, because it spoils, maybe it can't be used. On the other hand, it does have value. So peyrot, which is in this, also, not the abde chalipin, you can also use produce. Ketzad. So how does this work? And how does this work with the Mishnah, right? So the Mishnah is going to explain, he chalip, and now they're going to add an important word. Basal shor bepara. I traded you meat, the meat of the ox, for a para, for a cow. Oh, basar chamor beshor. Or I gave you the meat of a donkey for an ox. So what I traded you was food not animal for animal. I traded you meat from the animal for an animal. Then again, what happens? As soon as you pick up that piece of meat, I automatically, right? My para now, because, or whoever, right? Let's say, right? The, the other, the animal that hasn't yet moved hands at all is so one picks up the meat, that's a symbol, right? It's just symbolic. It's not like we're exchanging meat for animal. We're just, we're actually saying, right? Um, right. No, actually it would be chalipin, I guess. Or no, it would, right. It would be the symbolic. As soon as you pick up the meat, then already, that's already symbolic that the action was done. And even though the para, let's say, is still in my domain, it's basically yours. And again, that would mean either we can't change our mind about the deal, we can't renege, or it would mean, or maybe both, that Basically, the achrayut is on you. If something happens to an animal, I'm not responsible anymore. It's already yours, even though it's still in my domain. So now they say, so again, what this mission is really talking about is a symbolic chalipin. It teaches you money can be used for chalipin and also produce. 
Now that would only work if you hold the produce could be used for chalipin, but there's a machloket about it. So this possible explanation, again, this was all what they thought the Mishra was talking about in the first place, not what the Mishra really means. This works according to Rav Sheshet, to Amar Perot Avde Chalipin, because he thinks Perot can be used for Chalipin. But, how does Rav Nachman think this mission was read in, in originally when they, again, rejected the reading that Matbea Nasa Chalipin? But how did they read it in the first place? Because it can't be read again. We How do we connect sentence one with sentence two? According to Rav Sheshet, it's very easy. If they thought money could be chalipin, even though we in the end reject that. But then they said, and also Pirot added that whole sentence. And that was the transition to sentence number two, which really became now sentence number three, right? Money can be chalipin, produce can be chalipin, and here's how produce can be chalipin. And they added, number one, a whole sentence about Pirot, and they added deme. Oh, I'm sorry, and not deme. Let's give you the next one. They added basal, okay, meat. Instead of ox, meat of an ox. Instead of donkey, meat of a donkey. But Rav, Rav Nachman can't say that Pei wrote Avdei Chalipin, so therefore he couldn't possibly read that that's what they read into the Mishnah because he doesn't think that's true. So how can he read the Mishnah? Hachi Kamra. This could be a little bit of more abstract and uh, more whatever case. We'll see right now. Yesh damin shehen kechalipin. Sometimes money can work as chalipin. What does this mean? Ketzad. What does this mean? This means a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, 10 years ago, whatever it is, I sold you an ox. You owe me the money for that ox. You never paid it. I sold it to you on credit. You never paid me that money. So you owe me the money of an ox. That's the deme shore. You owe me the money for an ox. And now I come and I say to you, listen, I know you owe me this money. And I know you haven't paid me back. Maybe instead of giving me the money, because I see you don't have the money, maybe you'll give me, I see you have a really nice cow there. I'll take the cow in exchange. That's what we're doing here. Now, this is different. This is a whole different thing that we were talking about before. It doesn't mean money was the chalipin. What it means is we basically take the value of what you owe me. And I basically say, we make an agreement that I'm going to take your cow instead. Now, since you already owe me the money and we made this agreement, as soon as we, now here what's interesting is there's going to be a Kenyan without the exchange of any hands, any nothing. No handkerchief, no money moves hands. But there's an IOU out there. You owe me money. And I say, give me the cow instead. And you say, okay, the cow is yours. As soon as you agree to that, the cow is mine. And meaning you can't change your mind about the para. Or, or maybe end, if something happens to the para, it's my problem, not yours anymore, okay? That's what this mission is talking about. Totally different case, right? And this, I want you already to get that this is obviously a very rare case. How often is that kind of thing going to happen? It's not the most common case, and that's going to be important in a minute. So let's read again. This is how Rav Nachman could possibly, again, this was how to read the Mishnah according to what they thought that it was actually talking about money. And then, by the way, this reading could actually work because it's not saying that money could be used as chalipin, because this is something different. So hachi kamar, yesh damim, reading back from the line we just read, yesh damim shen chalipin, sometimes money could work for exchange and affect a kinyan, basically. Ketzad, he chalif damim shor bepara, so again, we agreed that the money you owed me would now be paid by your cow, or damim chamor, the money you owe me for the chamor would now be paid with an ox, for sure. My time, huh? now why does this work? The question is, why does this work? It's strange. First of all, based on what we learned in the beginning of the Masechet, do you remember? If the husband owes the woman money, he can say, instead of paying me the money, you'll be betrothed to me, but only because what? On what money is she being betrothed? She gets hana'a. Remember, you can't betroth the woman with a loan by canceling a loan, but you can with the benefit. And what's the what's affecting the transaction here? In the Kiyushin, it's the benefit she gets from knowing she now no, no longer needs to pay the money back. That's valued at something. When I know I don't have to pay money back, that's benefit that I gain. So likewise here, the benefit you gain by not having to pay back that money, that $100, now you gain that benefit. That's the benefit that affects the kinyan, okay? So now, this only works if you hold by Rabbi Yochanan, because what? 
because this is really money is affecting the kinyan. Now, if you hold, here we see it in the Gemara, last time we only saw it in Rashi, right? The whole reason, oh, really do it. Really, if I pay money, the object is mine. However, if we institute that really across the board, what will happen? It might be a case where all of a sudden your warehouse is burning and you say, I could care less. I'm not even bothering to put out the fire. This stuff isn't mine anyway. I already sold it to you. And what do I care? And that's really unfair to me because no one's watching my stuff. So because of that, we said Mashiach's cone. Okay, you actually have to pull the item. But here comes the big one. So why does it work in this case? And that's exactly what someone was asking before. Don't you have to pull it? And isn't that the whole problem? How could it be acquired by me, your cow, when it's still in your possession? Well, the rabbis only instituted ordinances in common cases. This is a very uncommon case. So when they changed the halacha by Torah law, that money does acquire, and they said it doesn't really, you have to do Mashiach, that's only in regular cases. This is not a regular case, and therefore this will work. And that's a possible way of reading the mission. Now, what's the problem? That only works if you hold by Rabbi Yochanan. But Lerish Lakish, Amar Mashiachah, Mephoresha Min Torah. But according to Rish Lakish, all the Mashiach works by Torah law. So this for sure would not affect the king. Yet. So how can he explain the Mishnah this way? Well, they're going to say the following. Well, we have two debates here. One is, does money acquire or not? And the other one is, which would allow us then to say, to make sure, yes, could work if you're Rabbi Yochanan. The other issue is, well, we only got to this because if you hold by Rav Sheshet, you could just say that the Mishnah is read as Peirot Avdei Chalipi. So Rish Lakish, who can't explain the mission like option three, would have to hold like Rav Sheshet, or it would work if he held like Rav Sheshet, because then he could read the mission like option number two. But if he holds like Rav Nachman, who says, Peirot don't do Chalipin, and money doesn't do Chalipin, but my Mokela, how could you explain the mission? Now, it's not exactly how could you explain the mission, because we still have the first explanation, which worked, that the mission was talking about trading a, an ox for a, for a cow. But again, we're trying to understand, this is how we got here in the first place. What did the Gemara think in the first place? How did they read the Mishnah when they started asking this question? How could you say Ma'od or Chalipin? And then either we said, right, they hold Ma'od or Chalipin and then they add Perot or Chalipin and all that. And, and that was how it connected to the second line. Or you said it was actually the value and it was this unique case. So Al Kor Chakir Rav Sheshat since he can't go with, the last option, you would have to go with the Rav Sheshet option. And you'd have to say that, Rav she- that Rish Lakish must hold like Rav Sheshet. Otherwise, he has no way to understand how this mission was read originally. So in the end, we end up with three possible readings of the mission. Okay, even though really the second two are not really accepted as options, but they do explain what the possible possibilities were earlier. And again, based on the debate of Rav Nachman and Rav Sheshet, and based on this other debate about Rish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan. Okay, finishing up now with the new Mishnah. Rishut HaGavoa B'Keset U'Rishut HaEdyot B'Chazaka. We're going to explain these in one minute in the Gemara a little better, but we're now comparing how the temple treasury acquires items as opposed to individuals. The temple treasury does acquire items with money as opposed to us who don't acquire items with money, as we said. Ma'od or not konod, right? Either on a Torah level or maybe at least on a rabbinic level, according to Rabbi Yochanan. But, right, Rishud Ahed Yod is bechazaka. Now, chazaka, we're going to see in the Gemara really means mashicha, not chazaka like chazaka of land. It's very confusing to use that term, but it means by holding it, right, holding it and pulling it. Amiratola gavoaka misiratola ahed yod. If you say, I'm sanctifying this animal to the temple, I'm sanctifying my house to the temple, just in words alone, it's acquired by the temple, okay? It's sanctified. So now we're going to see a bride to which explains this mission a little better. And with that, we'll finish for today. What does it mean that the temple treasury acquires things with money? Let's say you're the temple treasurer and you go out to buy sacrifices for the temple. So you buy animals for sacrifices. As soon as you give the money, those animals are yours. And meaning also they can't renege at all. Even if the animal is far, far away on the other side of the world, they obviously don't really mean that because they weren't acquiring animals that were on the other side of the world. But even if the animal, it's a way of <clears throat> making an exaggerated statement, if the animal is really far away, the money itself is kone, even though that wouldn't work for regular people, right? Uh, that we've learned many times, you would have to actually pull the animal for it to be yours. 
כיצד אמירתו לגבוה כמסירתו להדיוט? האומר, שור זה עולה, בית זה הקטש, זה סגזקטי, זה סגזקטי, this shore will be my, this ox will be for my korban, my burnt offering, or this house will be sanctified to the temple, which basically means I have to give the value of the house to the temple. אפילו בסוף העולם, even if the house is on the other side of the world, even if the animal is on the other side of the world, קנה. Okay, as long as I designated that animal, how I did that from far away across the world is a good question, but I made a deal with you. I said, I'm buying your animal to bring as a, as a korban and your animal's far away, right? That animal is mine at that point, okay? But behedyo lo kana ad shim shoch v'yachzi. Here we have the connection between Mashiach and Chazak until I pull it and then it becomes mine. Okay, that's it for today. We'll stop here and wishing everybody a good week.